Hi, folks. Steve Urban here, founder and CEO at recruiting and consulting firm RiderFlex. If you think today's tip or guest interview can help someone you know, please share this with them. And if you enjoy listening to our show, please subscribe to our channel and hit the like button on the episodes. Finally, aside from our podcast, our day job here at RiderFlex is to provide recruiting, staffing, and consulting services. You can visit riderflex.com to learn more about us and get the information on the services we provide. And now, a quick word from our sponsor and friends at Marketing 360. Try the number one marketing platform for small business. Everything you need from design to marketing to CRM. Learn more at marketing360.com. Marketing 360, fuel your brand. All right. If you see me hitting the mute button or anything, just keep going. That just means my dog's barking or I'm hacking up or whatever. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? Oh, uh, he's a little terrier, little little Yorkie. He's over here. Gotcha, somewhere. gotcha. He's usually, he's he got usually. a big bark though. He thinks he's super tough. Yeah. <laughs> he thinks he's tough. He's one of those little dogs, you know, like when he sees a bigger dog, when we're on her walk, he always thinks he wants to fight, but he, you know. He's got that Napoleon complex dialed he's, in. No doubt. But it's what's weird is um like if it's a female dog, no, he, it's no big deal. Like he almost acts like he doesn't even doesn't even see her, right? It's almost like she's not even there. But man, if it's a male dog, like he just he just wants to fight right away. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, he's got the yeah, little 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 complex there. Anyway, Andrew, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, you you in Charlotte today? Yes, I am. All right. So it looks like you you are you from there? I'm from uh, Vienna, Virginia, the northern part of the state, and then came down to the Charlotte area for college. Okay, right. Came down to, to play baseball, right? Yes, correct. Bef- correct. Before we get into that, though, tell me about your family a little bit. Mom, dad, siblings. Yeah. Give, me, give me some early history. Go for it. Okay, so I, I'm the youngest of three. I got an older brother about five years older, and then a sister smack dab in the middle of us. And uh, they're both brilliant in their own regards. My brother, he's a, a doctor at UVA's hospital. Wow. And then my sister's a special education teacher in the Richmond area. And then I, yep. I've always looked up to the two of them and really just tried to keep up. So I'll credit them with a lot of my success because I'm just like, how do I, I try to kind of follow in their footsteps? So they were always my guiding light. And then uh-huh. my parents, they still live in Northern Virginia. I had about as good of a childhood as you could really ask for. So uh, not much to complain about there. My dad's a high school music teacher at Georgetown Prep and I followed him up there for high school. So that was a lot of fun. And I tell everybody I meet that my mom's probably the most compassionate person you'll ever meet. So she's a, she's an angel to be around and uh, everybody loves talking to her. So ah, that's gotcha. a bit about the family. Oh, uh, that's very good. Okay. All right. You, so as a kid, when you were in high school, what straight A's, uh, you it, know, yeah, I, I've always been a nerd. Um, okay. And I, okay. I think the, the big contributor here is my brother went to the same high school. My dad taught at this high school. So if yeah, I ever got something less than a satisfactory grade, typically yeah. my dad would know by lunch before I would know. He's like, <laughs> oh, hey, I heard you struggled with, I don't know, your math test or something. <laughs> like, oh, I, I didn't know I struggled with my math test yet. <laughs> and then I always got the, uh, the comparisons to my older brother. And I, I describe my older brother in this way. You know, there are like two kids you typically dislike in class growing up. There's a kid that doesn't really need to study and he gets a 99. Then there's mm-hmm. a kid that just has an unbelievable work ethic and they get the 99. Mm-hmm. He's both of those personalities kind of meshed into one. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. You guys got along though? You got along with your siblings okay? Oh, yeah. I love my siblings. They're my two best friends. So that's, I'm that's very fortunate cool. in that regard. That's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You married, kids, girlfriends, partners? Yeah, what, I, what's- I, I'm engaged. I've been together with my fiance since we were 17 years old, and we'll be getting married this April. So really, really okay. Oh, yeah. all right. So the wedding is set. So uh, did she go to Davidson with you? No, she actually went to Duke, which was only about two hours away, and okay. both got to enjoy our own kind of individual college experiences. And we always rag on each other for who went to the better school in the state. Uh, I mean, you know, it depends, right? I mean, Davidson is a great school, right? It's not, it's not, it's not as well known as Duke, obviously, but that's a great school yeah. too. 
Uh, you guys stayed together in college. There was no like little breakups for like one year, no, or six months. I, there was no- I, I was so blessed to meet her when I did because we've gotten to enjoy now eight years together. Uh, but there was wow. never a doubt uh, across all those years. And again, we were fortunate. We were only two hours away. So it made it easy to visit each other pretty frequently. Now, Andrew, if you want to confess right now on the podcast and just say, look, I was with my baseball buddies and one night there were some girls. No, no, funny. never. Never. <laughs> I I, trust me, if if you met her, you'd be like, wow, Andrew, you lucked out. I don't know how you pulled this one off, but good for you. She she's way better looking than me. She is way smarter, funnier. I like if if you're at a a group gathering, she's the one that you want to be talking to, not me. So I'm just (laughs) I'm holding on for dear life here. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Very. What's she going to do? What's, what's her, what's her profession? Yeah. So I, I call her a trader because she went to Duke undergrad and then she went to UNC for grad school and she's now a doctor <laughs> of physical therapy. What? Wow. Okay. How do you go from Duke to UNC? I didn't think you could do that. Isn't that like against the I, law or something? <laughs> I, I, that's what I was asking. And it's funny because I'll ask her, I'm like, so does this make you a Tar Heel fan now just to yeah, kind of grind yeah. her gears? Cause I, I know it's not at all the way it happened. She's like, actually going to UNC made me a bigger Duke fan. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. You guys go to the basketball games at Duke? Yeah, we did back when she was a student because we could get in for free. Now uh, they're pretty pricey tickets, so we have mm. to be a little bit more selective. Were you one of those fans that are like, like right behind the bench where like, like – the kid's arm is almost touching the basketball yeah, player. I've seen those the, photos. That is crazy. The, the true Cameron crazies. Uh, she she certainly was. She would camp out for the Duke UNC game and do all the body really? paint and the, wow. the ridiculous things those Duke students did just to watch two hours of basketball. You have to commend <laughs> them for it. I mean, meanwhile, I'm at Davidson. I'm like, I, look, I know basketball isn't quite as good as Duke, but still really good D1 basketball. I'd walk up a minute before tip and pick where I'd want to sit. It was a really <laughs> good right. life for me. <laughs> Did you play basketball and baseball uh, at Davidson? Did you uh, play I, I, I wish I was good enough to play basketball at Davidson, but no, okay. just baseball. Okay. Well, you did you go on a scholarship there for baseball? Yes, I, I was. So uh, how about I, that? Did I you? Luck- wow. Go ahead. I, I was going to say I lucked out. I knew, um, you know, pretty early on in my high school career, I wanted to find a way to pay for my college education and okay. uh, Davidson was a, the perfect blend for me. And I, I got a nice scholarship there and found myself in a situation where college was paid for. So I got a great education nice. and fortunately didn't have the you know, significant amounts of debt that a, a lot of college mm. students are graduating with now. Like your, like your brother, the doctor, who's probably still paying off his, <laughs> his, his bills. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I was going to say he's taking the, the really long journey to a very high salary. So mm-hmm. we, we always joke. We're like, one day you're going to feel rather wealthy. One day. <laughs> he, he, he's still on that slow uphill climb. Uh, it's so funny. I, I, that's Yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. So are you a big guy? Like, are you, you know, athlete? So you're an athlete. Are you uh, like, what, I'm, what I'm, a scrap, you? I'm a scrappy guy. I, I was, I'm only five, nine. So I always really, I, I had to pride myself on being fairly strong to compete at the highest level. So at my heaviest in college, and, and again, this was more muscle density. I was about 200 pounds. I, Five, I lost nine, about, 200. Wow. You're okay. Now that's, that's a, yeah, that's a. I, I couldn't <laughs> fit in a pair of pants too well. Uh, I was, I was pretty bulky back then. Uh, my fiance used to make fun of me. She's like, you, you just look disproportionate. <laughs> And now I've lost about 30 pounds and I think 25 of it was in my, my thighs and my glutes. Okay. So I, I was going to say, I, I saw did, a picture. I saw a picture of you uh, playing baseball. I pulled up a photo of you, found something of you online. And I, I thought, yeah, he's, he's an in shape, thick, thick guy, you know, like, <laughs> okay. So now we're, now you're weighing like what? 170, 165. Where are you at? Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit leaner now. So okay. I'm, I'm happy. I feel way better. My body doesn't hurt as much anymore. Mm. Is your fiance okay with this new look? Is she all right with it? Oh, she she's a much bigger fan. She's like, you look uh, proportional again, and I, <laughs> I look a little bit more like I used to look back when we were in high school. Okay, so. uh, all right, that's cool, man. You guys are still together. I'm so I'm so that's 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 a great story. Very good, very good. Okay, so now you were very what I would call, from what I can tell, what I looked up, you were very kind of entrepreneurial, so to speak at an early age, you're involved in a bunch of activities, you're doing different things. Like I could see all the, 
the makings of an entrepreneur there, you know, uh, did you know that's what you wanted to do? Were you, when you were in college, were you thinking I'm going to be a baseball player or I'm going to be an entrepreneur? Oh man. Uh, so going into college, I thought I w- I'm going to be a baseball player. Okay. And I remember I, I was looking at how I wanted to map out my academic career at Davidson. Like I, I've always been one of those people. I plan way too far into the future. I'm that guy. And I was like, Oh, if I'm good enough at baseball, and maybe I'll get drafted after my junior year. But if I get drafted after my junior year, I want to have a degree. So I always kind of had this in the back of my head of I've got a three-year plan to try to graduate college. Uh, it turns out I wasn't even close to good enough at baseball to get drafted after my junior year. So spoiler alert on the story there. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think in ways I really lucked into being an entrepreneur. As I reflect on it now, there are moments in my life where I'm like, oh, yeah, that was an obvious sign. I love building. I love creating. I, I was going to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. But I remember I always had kind of this like ongoing life crisis growing up because, you know, the common question everybody asks is, what do you want to be when you're older? Mm-hmm. And uh, like outside of knowing I love to play baseball at the time, I'm like, I, I don't really know. I'm. I'm really curious about a lot of things. Like, I think engineering could be fun. I think okay. being a doctor could be fun. I think being a lawyer could be fun. And I, I could really envision myself doing any one of those things and enjoying it. So I never okay. was like, this is exactly what I want to do. I remember it was the, I think like September of my junior year at Davidson. The gentleman who endowed my scholarship built one of the like largest business consulting practices in the world. And Oh, that's, just, where, this, just, uh, that's where this internship came into play. Yeah, well, he was just brilliant beyond imagination. And I remember I was calling and asking him for career advice. And like, you know, sneakily, I'm kind of hoping at the end of this, I would ask for a a recommendation to this consulting firm. I see. And during the conversation, he tells me, don't go into consulting. And I was like, okay, uh, this is a little bit odd. Like you help build this amazing institution. And you're telling me not to go into consulting. Can you, can you, Walk me through this thought process. Right. And he's like, well, look, when, when I joined consulting, which I think was back in the 70s, he's like, I left banking. It was very risky and it was a, a new and evolving field. And I'm glad I did it back then. Okay. And he said, but right now, consulting is a placeholder. How mm-hmm. many people grow up and they continue to be that business consultant from the time they graduate until they're, they're 40 or whatever? Not, happens to be? not many. Yeah, you know, most then go on to get their MBA and go yep. work in some other Fortune 500 yep. company, or they're really excited about the product one of their clients is building, and then they mm-hmm. join that client as a full-time employee. But it, it's typically a, a stepping stone, and that's the way he described it to me. He's like, rather than going and doing that, think about what you really want to do. Figure that out and go do that. You're young. You can take risks. Go do what you're really passionate about. And then I was like, okay. huh. Then you're like, then, then you're like, okay, what is my passion besides baseball? <laughs> I was like, what, what am I really passionate about? <laughs> right. And I, Davidson was putting on this, at the time they called it the failure fund, which I gave him some grief for back in the day. I said, it's a pretty bad, I, anyway, sorry. So the concept <laughs> is they give you $5,000 to go try out this business idea. And they oh, called it the failure. Do you, have fund. To like, do you have to like apply? Do you have to like apply or pitch or whatever? Yeah, yeah. You, like, you had to apply. There's an interview, like all, right. all these okay. different things. Okay. And I, I joked with them. I was like, look, nobody wants to say I won the failure fund. Like, that's not a good thing to put on a resume. <laughs> like, I won the failure fund. Like, you, are you the biggest failure? What does this mean? Yeah, what, what is, is it? What is this? <laughs> the, the reason behind it was good. It's like we want our students to go take a risk and kind of bet on themselves to try to prove out some form of a business idea. And I saw this probably like three days before it was due. And I I don't even remember what my idea was at the time. It wasn't that great. And I didn't get it, but I was talking to uh, another one of my friends on the baseball team who just had more or less a career ending injury. And he's like, well, I, I, I'm applying with another friend. We're thinking about doing this idea. And the, the idea was, using robotics to clean buildings. Okay. So it's, a, it's evolved a good bit since then, but they, That's also where it's up, okay. they, they also ended up not getting the award, uh, which okay. we still give our college grief about. But we, we ended up kind of all three of us getting together saying, wow, this is a really good idea. We like the market. Like, how do we want to start building this company? And we weren't really deterred by losing that competition. And I that see. was the genesis for oh. uh, Lucid and what was to come. 
the okay, humble now, beginnings of failing to win the failure fund. How about that? Interesting. Okay, so then you get to know these guys; they're your friends, mm-hmm. um, and then over time, it walk me into how it got to drones. How did it? How yeah. did it go? For, yeah, it, go for it. it. Pretty quickly, we were asking ourselves, like, what's the the path of least resistance? How quickly could we prove out some form of a robotic platform cleaning a building? We went to liberal arts school. Uh, between us, our majors were economics, math, philosophy, and Spanish. So none of that was engineering. <laughs> and, and we're like, okay, well, we can't build a robot from the ground up. The drone space is evolving pretty quickly. Drones yes. could be a really good way to clean buildings. You know, they're versatile and their flight capabilities. I can go up and down easily, left to right, you name it. And we went and kind of pulled together our savings and bought a third party drone off the shelf and said, let's build hardware and software around this. That's going to allow us to clean a building. And the nice thing is that allowed us to quickly prove out the concept of drone cleaning. We're like, can I, let me, let me, let me, let me pause you right there. When you bought that first drone, when you bought that first drone, you guys are like putting the bucket on it to hold the chemicals or whatever. (laughs) Are you, are you, uh, what, 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 where, what is, is this junior year, senior year? Are you done with college? Yeah, so, where is this time? So, so this is, this is still junior year. It's uh, we spent most okay. of the fall kind of ideating, thinking about it. And then finally we're like, you know what? Let's just pull the trigger. Let's do okay. this. Let's go all in. And we, we buy this third party drone, spend some time learning to fly, tinkering. And I'll tell you the, the first proof of concept flight we ever did with a cleaning system Let's just say it was more duct tape and zip tie than it was carbon fiber at the time. It was a very, very hacked together solution, quick and dirty, minimum viable product. But it opened our eyes to like, wow, this could be something really big one day. Do you have video of the do you have video of that first flight? Because you should put that on your YouTube channel. Oh, yeah, we've got a lot of videos of the the early Uh. flight. So, I think that would I'll, be I think that would be interesting. I think that would be uh, uh, that would be cool. People would like I'll that. Fast anyway, go ahead. This, I'll fast forward the story a bit because it, it gets a little bit more entertaining down the road. But okay. we're going through the winter and we're like, yes, we want to do this. And we had our college's venture fund competition in oh. like April of that junior year. And for Another us, that was to, everything. A chance to and win we, cash. Yeah, we, it was redemption time for us. We failed at winning the failure fund. So right. we're like, okay, if we win this venture fund, it was $25,000 for us. Oh, man, there's so your seed like it, money. There's your, there's your it, seed it, money right there. It, this was our holy grail. Our biggest issue at the time is like, we need a bigger drone that lifts more weight. That's all we're missing. Or So we thought, we learned business is a lot harder than just that. <laughs> uh, but we, we end up getting team with this great team of mentors, learned a ton about business, really started to put some legs around it being more than just an idea. It started to evolve into a business okay. and we ended up winning the competition, which was awesome. You won it. You won the competition. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big I, deal. All right. That, that is a big deal. Cause you're living off fumes until you get to 25 K. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Big deal. Uh, right. And it, there was a delay in getting that money. So we still lived off of fumes Oof. for a while, but okay. anyway, uh, we, we won that competition and we started to talk to some local angel investors and like some startup accelerator programs for stuff to do over the summer. And uh, what we quickly heard from people is like, look, this is a great idea. We, we'd love to invest in it. We think it's got a lot of potential. We do not like it as a side hustle. Like this is a side project. So if you come out to this accelerator program, would you go back to college in the fall? And we're all let me let me let me let me pause you right there. Let me pause you right there. How did you find these VC people? How did you find these these accelerated people? How how did you were they in your circle? Did you guys know somebody? At the start, our our like investor network really came from that Davidson Venture Fund competition and that group of mentors we originally met. So we were really lucky that we got an excellent team. We always joke we think it was stacked for us somehow because we lucked out with the best mentors and. Uh, to this okay. day, still have relationships with them. And okay, so they so they're like they're like come to the accelerator, but of course that means they get a piece of the action. They want you to join the accelerator to get a piece of the company. Yeah, well, I, they're almost two separate things. So, like on the one hand, we had some local angel investors that were interested in you know putting some money into the company, and okay. on the other path, we could have gone to a, a few accelerators, or we had been applying to accelerators. But mm-hmm. the recurring theme for all of them was. Look, there's nobody doing this full time. Like if I'm going to give you money or I'm going to welcome you into this yes. program, yes. if this takes off, are you going to leave school behind and focus on this full time? Good question. And 
you know, we're, we're all kind of looking at each other like, wow, you know, Davidson's a really hard school. Like we're working hard here. We're, are we going to leave just with one year left on the table? Uh, and then fortunately, you know, as I mentioned earlier, baseball didn't pan out in terms of getting drafted after junior year. But luckily, my academic transcript was still aligned for that plan. So I, I pretty much looked at my courses and realized, wow, I could get out of here. You know, I could graduate after three years and go and focus on this full time. Uh-huh. So that, that's what I did. I graduated that spring. What about uh, your friends? What and about they your still went back for their senior year. So I had oh. a, a very, very learn, lonely first year of full time building Lucy, <laughs> where we, uh. We, uh, we went out at the time and we said, you know, the fastest way for us to, to prove this is working is to be the cleaning company. And we wanted to show that drone cleaning could work and work well. So we had to go out and do it repeatedly. So by myself, I cleaned dozens and dozens of buildings that first year. Anywhere from Maryland down to Alabama to Miami, like you name it. I was kind of all over the place just trying to clean buildings and show the, the broad versatility and effectiveness. Now, and now, that, let me, now, let me ask you, are you doing this for free to get to get traction or you're charging and you actually have revenue now? We, we, we were at the time we were charging. So very okay, early you, on. OK, OK. And you were and you were pitching yourself as a cleaning company, not a drone company. Yeah, back back then we were pitching ourselves as a cleaning company because we're like, who's okay. gonna want to take a cleaning drone before they know a cleaning drone works? Like, we need to go and show that yes, you can clean these types of buildings, these surfaces. This is how much money you can. Okay, make. okay. What, how did you? How did you? How, how did you get the business? Did you take the twenty five k and invest some dollars uh, in like Google AdWords, or, or how did you? How did you get the marketing for that? So much of it was just hustle. Um, I'd say the best thing we did was network. So we asked okay. a lot of people within our Davidson circle, within the circle of our early investors, just every single person we knew in the area. When okay. we go out and do the job, the first thing we'd ask is, can you give me three names? Can you give me three numbers? Mm. And just try to grow a little bit more organically that way. Okay. And then I, I can't even quantify the number of cold calls I did during that first year. <laughs> um, I, my, my ego was just like, I was so humbled during that first year by <laughs> how many things go into try to building a business. And I, the cold calling was probably the most humbling of those because every now well, and then you had, you had two, you, had, you actually had two humbling experiences. Number one, you were getting hit with the fact that professional baseball probably wasn't in the cards. <laughs> And number two, yeah. you're making cold calls and people are just hanging up on you. And you're like, okay, damn, yeah. well, this is a I, tough year. And, and, and I'd say like the, the most humbling part of it all too was, you know, my, my friends more than anything. My family was always really, really supportive throughout this all. Which I look back on it and I'm like, this was crazy. Like I would have <laughs> probably told myself I was crazy looking back on it. Like at the yeah. time, all my friends, my teammates, they, they thought I was insane because here I am. I'm a, I was a double major in economics and Spanish. And I said, I am going to go start a drone company. (laughs) And by the way, we hadn't built our own drone yet. We didn't even have like, we didn't even have a a working uh, functional drone cleaning system. Like it was- And you're not an an engineer and you didn't have any engineers on the team. (laughs) And I, and I wasn't an engineer. So I, again, it was just all ridiculous to think about. Uh, And I, I couldn't be more grateful that I did it because of what I ended up learning. But anyway, during that first year of trying to prove the services, what happened quickly is this drone technology we're using from a third party just kept failing over Mm. and over Mm. again. It Mm. was like really easy issues. Like Mm. a motor wouldn't spin, a controller wouldn't connect. And what we quickly realized is we had to build our own technology. And I, <laughs> we were running out of money at this point. And we had all this money invested in like third party drones that weren't working. Mm. And they just weren't supporting us. Their expectation is if you have an issue with your drone, buy a new one. And we're like, uh, <laughs> or you should fix it. Cause and there was no more, there was no other investment cash. All you had was the 25 K seed money, right? You still didn't by, have any other. By, by that point we had raised a, a, a small round of capital so we okay. had a little bit more to play with, but I was still eating rice, beans, peanut butter, <laughs> and fasting. Those were the four things <laughs> in my diet. Gotcha. Um, so it was still shoestring budget at the time. Okay. And we're like, we're going to run out of cash soon. And I remember telling my co-founders, that this was over their winter break. And we're just kind of all like, I don't want to say sulking, but we were sulking because we didn't have a working drone. And we had all this money tied up in defective drones. 
I just look at it, I was like, guys, what, what if I learned how to build our own drones? And they're like, what, what if, what if <laughs> <Yeah>. you did? <laughs> uh, like, that'd be amazing. Like, do you think you could do it? And I'm like, we'll find out. And <laughs> I essentially locked myself in this like attic above a garage for three months. And all I did was read books on drones and robotics and kind of taught myself all the, the basic fundamentals of the mechanical mm. design, the electrical design, the, the basic programming that went into building a drone. At the end of three months, we came out with this drone that could lift twice the payload of the one we had been using. And wow. I was able to program it to do these basic autonomous flights. And with that technology and then our kind of business pivot of saying, we don't want to provide the services in the long run. We want to lease this technology to the existing cleaning companies. Mm. That plus the, the status of our technology was good enough to get us an interview for Y Combinator. And we were fortunate. They, they liked what we had to say at that interview. And within days of my co-founders graduating, all three of us went out uh, to San Francisco to be at Y Combinator for the summer. And I joke with them to this day. I was like, you, you rolled fresh out of Davidson and walked into Y Combinator. That was the start of your full-time career. The right. start of my full-time career was like sweating it out, eating PB&Js every day, on the road, cleaning buildings. So I, I, I still uh, heckle them a little bit for it. Wow. Wow. So th is the technology like patented, super secret, like, are you a, are you a, are you a software company now? Are you a tech company? What what are you? Yeah, it, it, it's very much a tech company. So okay. when people ask what we do at Lucid, we always say we're building autonomous drones for labor intensive jobs, starting with the exterior cleaning market. So our main customer today are existing service providers, and our goal is to at least submit technology to then do more jobs in less time with less liability. And then in terms of like our, our team here at Lucid. You know, our biggest headcount is in engineering, and we're always trying to push the frontier limits of the technology. So we do everything from, you know, actually designing the, the mechanical side of the drone to the electrical and then the programming as well. And where we see a lot of our future is in the software and in the autonomy. Are you a man? Who's manufacturing it for you? Yeah. So as of uh, the start of October, we just launched a manufacturing partnership. Up okay. until then, we've been doing it all in-house. And we actually partnered with a, a company about a town north of us. So they're maybe 15 minutes up the road. Okay. And they were previously in the NASCAR manufacturing business and huh. have just decades of excellence under their belt. And there are a lot ah. of changes going on in the racing world. So they're like, hey, we've got some extra capacity and we're really good at building things. We mm. said, ooh, we need to build more drones and we want somebody really good at building them. And I think what we like most about the story is it's, it's all local. And yeah, that's what we really wanted cool. to keep was we wanted to mm, keep manufacturing mm, as mm, close mm. to in-house as possible, because yeah. for us, we pride ourselves now on providing our customers a high level of support, which is why we lease it. We don't sell our drones outright because we more or less embed this expectation of ongoing customer support. So by having our, our inventory and all of our manufacturing right next to us, we can provide much better support than if we're always having to go overseas for stuff. And, and so your primary client right now is Johnny's Johnny's cleaning company in Denver that yep. cleans driveways and houses and fences mm -hmm. and whatever. And now you're, you're selling, you're leasing, excuse me, the drone to Johnny uh, is yes. basically how it works. Okay. Exactly. Okay. The, the, the best way to put it is we're giving these cleaning companies the shiniest tool in the toolkit. Mm. And uh, some of the interesting things the owners of these companies have, have reported back to me of what they really like about the drone is, as you know, like over 4 million people left their jobs in August. Yeah. And it's just showing that as we continue to evolve technology and humanity evolves as well with technology, People just don't want to be doing these mundane, right. repetitive, service-based right. jobs. That's like right. At, down to our core at Lucid, you know, we believe in building a world where responsible robotics empower people to live happier and healthier lives. So mm. taking that worker that's hanging off the side of the building, relocating them to a safer place, or freeing up workers to go pursue more creative and meaningful version of work. Like that's what we're really, really passionate about. And it's just such an interesting time in the market because you're seeing these unbelievable and staggering statistics of people showing they don't want to be doing these jobs either. 
So there's this, this huge need for the technology. And that's what the, the owners of these companies mm. get excited about is, oh, I can take my current workforce and effectively double or triple my revenue potential due to the efficiency gains of this technology. And the best part is I don't have to worry about the drone showing up on time for work today. <laughs> you right. You know, uh, you, every time I interview a robotics uh, executive on the RiderFlex podcast, they usually say the same thing, which is, hey, look, we're not we're not building robots to replace all jobs. We're building robots to replace shitty jobs that humans don't want to do anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I mean, amen to that. And it's it's frustrating sometimes because we always want to be going faster. Like mm. it's really something that we're incredibly obsessive over at Lucid. How do we go faster? Because we're, we're still seeing people lose their lives in this industry. I know mm. the, the other week, there were two people cleaning a roof, a, a ladder fell, it hit a power line, and they lost their lives. Mm. Like, that, mm. that doesn't have to happen. It doesn't. Mm-hmm. Like, we have technology mm. that can relocate those people to the ground, put them in a safer place, and they could get that same job done without the same hazards. So it, it's one of those things where we're just always saying, like, how do we get to more markets? How do we get to more people? How do we just really disseminate this technology as quickly as possible to create the optimal impact. Are you, how, how big are you? Um, I know you can't share specifics with revenue and things, but are you nationwide? Are you just North yeah, Carolina? Yeah. Are you, are you, how many employees? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what you want to yeah, share. Yeah, yeah. But like, what's, go ahead. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to say we're growing at, at this point. I'd say we're pretty close to nationwide. We uh, okay. will be launching our first customer in California soon, Cool. Uh, but we've cool. got customers in Texas, New York, down in Florida, uh, South Carolina, just pretty much all over the place now. Great. We're really focused on uh, United States customers for now. And what we always talk about as a sales team, that's pretty interesting is we, we get a lot of inbound demand through our website because what we do is fairly eye catching you know, like within the cleaning world, uh, squeegees and mops, and they're not quite as eye catching as a drone flying and cleaning mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. But probably 70 to 80 percent of that inbound demand is international. Really There's a huge international appetite for the cleaning drones, which is why, really why is that? What, what, what's what's driving that? Uh, you know, I, I, I could speculate a lot about a lot of different regions and why I think part of it is. The United States is a little bit slower with drone adoption because we have a more strict regulatory environment. Oh. And uh, I don't know. It, it sometimes it could be it. Yeah. These yeah. international countries are like, let's move fast and try new things. And they have access to huh. an unfathomable amount of capital. And they're always trying to innovate with it. What, how do you guys stay ahead of the competition? Well, I guess my question is, and I don't even know who the competition is, but if I owned a cleaning company, and by the way, by the way, coincidentally, this is just, I had no idea this tied together before we were going to do the podcast till I was studying you this morning. My oldest son owns a cleaning company in Oklahoma City. Like he has the, he has the trailer with the power washer and the whole thing. That's unbelievable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's called Urban Cleaning Pros. And uh, okay. I, I can't wait to send him this, the, the, our interview because he's going to be like, what? Yeah. Okay. He's going to be like, what, what? He's going to want me to put you in contact with him. Um, Let's do it. My question is, how do you stay ahead of the competition? If I owned a cleaning company, all these other manufacturers of drones, I mean, aren't they going to try to build a drone that they can just sell to me? And they're, they're, yeah. they're going to knock on my door and they're going to be like, look, Andrew is cool and all, but instead of leasing his product, all you got to do is buy mine and blah, blah, blah. How do you, how do you yeah. stay ahead of that? How are you saying so I, there are a lot of different ways to, to answer this, but I, I think one of the most obvious ones is just our business model. So what we okay. identified early is industrial drones are a lot like cars and we recognize, you know, cars need maintenance from time to time to keep working and working I well. See. I see. And it, these drone companies today, they're really fixated on these smaller drones that have nice cameras. They, they fly around mm-hmm. and take cool pictures and videos and observe the world around them. But when we think of drones at Lucid, we, we tend to think of these bigger models that physically affect the world around them by doing some type of productive and meaningful task. So okay. Like on the one hand, there's already like a, a, a big difference in what we focus on. But the, the second half of that is these companies tend to compete on high volume, low margin business. They're typically based overseas and they're just selling their drones outright. And as I mentioned earlier, if you have an issue, 
you might as well throw that drone in the trash and mm. buy a new one because okay. support isn't something that uh, they excel at. And okay. we pretty much flip that on its head by going and leasing our drones because we've built our whole entire business model on how do we empower our customers? How do we train them? How do we support them after that training and make mm. sure they're continuing to use our technology and make more money with the technology? Like I we see. have a whole customer success division where their whole focus is just interacting with our current customers, answering any questions they have and making sure they're really happy with their overall experience. And that's not something other drone companies are doing today. And then the, the other half of that answer is, uh, of course, we're always looking at intellectual property development, okay. and things that are okay. novel that we can try and protect, and then just continuing to push the, the frontier limits of this technology. Okay, we okay. Started the my... company, go, um, go ahead. I was gonna say, when we first started years ago, uh, what we thought drone cleaning would look like versus what it's actually evolved to be are night and day different things. And it's just fun because, you know, every single week we either continue to learn new things ourselves internally or get really valuable feedback from our customers where we've been able to just keep iterating and iterating and really getting ahead on this focused application for drones. Because today other drone companies just aren't necessarily looking at it because there's such an appetite for other applications like drones with cameras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. If my drone breaks down. Mm -hmm. And I live in California. How are you going to service me? What what do I have to ship it to you? Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you train a tech out there to come? How do you do that? Yeah. So for us right now, it's more shipping dependent. So okay. we'd immediately send you a shipping layout label. You put I it see. on the drone. The UPS would come and pick it up. And then we have another one inventory that we'd send out to you to get you back up and flying as quickly as possible. That was my was going to be my follow up question is how do you get me back in business because if my drone's not here I can't do anything. So now is that a reason to lease is that a reason to talk to your clients into leasing two just in case one is down? Yeah, so we have in some instances had customers say you know we want to take two because we'll use two but then we always have an emergency yes. backup if we're doing a job in the middle of the night and we know we're going to need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's kind of like if you I always heard that if you ever were in the trucking business. You got to have at least two trucks or else, you know, because if one truck's down, you're you're dead in the water. Right. Mm -hmm. So do hmm, you get a discount if you lease two? Uh, we usually do look at some multiple discounts, but typically the number's a little higher than just two. All right. Is it month to month? Is it six months? Is it annual contracts? What's the model? Gen generally, it's a 12 month contract. 12 months now. I'm hey, I'm a small little cleaning company. I know I hate signing 12 month contracts. My cash flow is super tight. What if I. What if winter slows down? What if I lose some clients? Now I'm stuck into the contract. What are you going to do for me, Andrew? <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, those are conversations we have all the time. <laughs> the best thing we can do is just walk people through the numbers. So the way to look at the drone is it's a growth tool. This is okay. something that not only helps you do more jobs in the same amount of time, but it also helps you get a lot of jobs because it's a huge competitive differentiator. There are, you know, almost 100,000 exterior cleaning companies in the United States, and there's very little differentiation between them because they're so fragmented. Because somebody could, you know, at the end of the day, if they really wanted to, they could go get a pressure washer from Lowe's, climb up on a ladder or True. rent a boom lift and try to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, the quality and all that other stuff would be a little bit iffy. But again, it is very fragmented. So by bringing in this innovative technology, they've now incredibly strengthened their position in the eyes of these property owners and managers because it's telling these property owners, I'm not going to put somebody on the side of your building. I'm mm. investing in technology to provide you with the highest quality of service. Mm. And mm. again, we're, mm. we're still fairly new into launching these cleaning drones with third parties. So there's often not 500 other people in that same market doing it. So they really stand out amongst the competition. Mm. Very good. When I saw the video that you have on your website, by the way, for the listeners right now, let me just get this in there, right? It is luciddronetech.com, luciddronetech.com, right? Um, and Andrew Asher can be found on LinkedIn. You can connect with him there as well um, and uh, read all about him and uh, see, see everything you need to see. The video that's on the website, the little YouTube video, there's no sound. I'm, I'm, I truthfully don't know which one is. Is it the the cleaning demo or is it one of the time lapses? If you go, if you go on, the, if you go on, the, yeah, it's one of the time lapse. Mm, 
Yeah. You, you, that, you need put some. Here's what you need. I, need. I want you to do two things with that video, Andrew. Yeah. Number one, put some cool music on it. Number two, can you have like some hot chicks walking around, maybe in the background or something? <laughs> Make it a little more animated. Yeah. I'm just playing around. Uh, no, the reason I brought up the video is this. My first reaction to the video. What do you think it was when I was watching it? What do you think my first, as a business person, um, what do you think my first reaction was? I was just wondering mm. if you get this. Wondering if you get this from anybody. Like if I, I was an, I, if if I was an investor. If you were an investor, if you were like say the the business owner of that property. Yeah, would, yeah. Or or if I or if you were pitching me, if you were pitching me as an investor, and I watched the video. Well, anyway, I'll just tell you what I was thinking. I was yeah. watching. I was like, okay, this is cool, but like, how fast does that water run out? They can only hold so much water in that. Like, what does the drone have to come down like every three mm. minutes and refill with water? How do, how does that work? Yeah, so it's tethered by a hose to an on-ground cleaning system. Oh. So in the in the bed of your truck, for example, you've got these oh. massive water tanks or cleaning solution mm. tanks, and you just run it up to the drone, so the drone doesn't have to carry as much weight. Interesting. When I first watched the video, I missed that hose because it's almost oh, it's, okay. All right, very cool. All right, all right, awesome. So you don't have it doesn't have to come down to the ground unless it runs out of gas. Exactly. Interesting, and the pressure of it, I guess, was my second thing, right? How, it's, 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 surely it's not the same amount of pressure that's going to come out of the wand that I'm holding from my giant trailer. Yeah, so it, it, the answer is it, no, it's not. What we do is much more of uh, what's referred to as soft washing. So it's oh. using lower pressure, typically about the PSI of what you find in a garden hose or a little stronger, and then okay. relying on the, the cleaning solution to do the heavy lifting of the stain removal. I think in that video, it was a, a moldy tile roof, molded okay, organic yeah. compound with uh -huh. a root system. So the best way to treat that wouldn't be to come in and blast those tiles with high uh, pressure because you're, uh, you're one, probably going to break them, but two, I you're see. not going to actually kill that root system. But the mm. cleaning solution is a much more responsible detergent that helps remove it at the, the base of the problem. Okay, very cool. I like it. Do, do the neighbors ever complain like, hey, man, you got to get that with the drones been flying around for three hours? Uh, so it, it, it's funny because the, the drone, when it's cleaning, also becomes a spectator sport. I oh. doubt you've ever just stopped walking in the middle of the day to watch somebody clean a building. But <laughs> I, I know uh, one of our customers was joking with us. They're like, we almost need to hire another people for these jobs just for crowd control. <laughs> uh, which is a, a funny perspective. But uh, I remember back when we were first building these drones, uh, we rented this house with like a tiny backyard and all my early drone builds, uh, we were flying in the backyard, probably not the optimal testing area what I, based on what I know now. And I, I was the worst. Like I didn't know any better at the time, but probably not polite to be flying a drone at like 8.30 at night testing yeah. a new feature. Yeah, so those neighbors not. were... Those neighbors were thrilled when we did not uh, decide to do a second year in that house. <laughs> Very good. Uh, have you, uh, do, do you train the, the person, do you send somebody out to train me how to fly this damn thing? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, so usually we invite them to come visit us here in Charlotte because you know, oh. we've got a good network and a lot of different okay. properties we can take them out to. And we've got an individual who's responsible for training and onboarding these customers. So mm, he helps mm. walk you through pretty much everything A to Z on how to fly the thing. What are the, the most responsible cleaning solutions for different surfaces? How should you think about pricing? And then just general maintenance. Okay. Does the lease automatically include maintenance? It's, it's very similar to like a car lease, right? If you're driving and you're texting and you run into a stop sign, you know, Toyota is not just going to fix that for free. They're going to bill you for it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you're driving down the highway and your brake light comes on, that's when we'll step in and we'll cover it. So that could be great. That could, you're, that's a, you, you, there's a little gray in there. You get, uh, I'm, <laughs> you're on the phone with Johnny and you're like, okay, Johnny, now you sure you didn't run it into the house. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do you have insurance on these things? Yeah, so every customer needs to have aviation insurance for the drone. So we really prioritize safety as part of our oh. operations because, oh. again, that's why we started. We wanted to make this a safer job. So we, we go to great lengths to make sure we're doing that. Do I have to be certified or something, like have some sort of license to fly it? 
Yeah. So you need to have your, uh, it's called your FAA part 107 license. It's to do commercial drone operations. And it's a, a pretty straightforward 60 question, multiple choice test that you could say, take at a local testing center or airport. How much does that cost? It's about $150. Okay. So it's not super expensive to get licensed or, or whatever. My total investment to get a drone and get trained and everything and take it out to my first project is how much? Yeah, so I, again, it kind of varies depending upon what different options you want to choose. Uh, right now, our, our drones are approximately $2,500 a month to lease. $2,500 a month? Mm-hmm. That's, see, my, my immediate reaction to that is that's pricey. Tell me why that's not pricey. I, I was going to say, I, I'm not surprised you would say it's pricey, but think about it this way in terms of what it then helps you do. So on average, we're typically hearing from customers, they're cleaning buildings up to five times faster. And oftentimes the amount of money they're making on these jobs, they you know run into the thousands and thousands of dollars. So mm-hmm. if you can now help that person do just one extra job a month with a drone, which is uh, very much so an underestimate, you've more than paid back the cost of your drone because we've had many different instances where per hour of flight time, our customers are making over a thousand dollars per hour of flight time on a job. Mm. So when this thing's in the air, it's a, it's a money-making machine. How did you get to that number? How did you, did you factor in like, okay, this is the life of the drone and this is the maintenance. Mm. And by the time they lease it for this long, the drone's dead. They got to get, no, I'm I'm assuming you ran a bunch of, yeah. there's a ton of, um, you know, business economics that factor into that in okay. terms of what we expect the support to be, what our material costs are and okay. uh, this, that, and the other. And again, we try to make it really competitive with alternative methods. So if you wanted mm. to rent just like a 40 foot boom lift, which is really small, like you can't do much with a 40 foot boom lift, uh, that monthly cost is typically going to be about 2,500 to $3,000 a month. Oh, so it's okay. like, hey, right. we're we're right. less than what you're paying for a 40 foot boom lift. So we this is lim- higher. Oh, we can okay. clean faster. Oh. So it, it also there's a little bit of a price anchor there in terms of what the market knows. So now you're eliminating another expense for me that I already have. Then I'm mm-hmm. replacing. Mm-hmm. I see. That's a good pitch. I like that. OK. All right. All right. Very cool. So the, 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 the rental right. companies aren't necessarily thrilled with the, the amount of lifts we're displacing, but Oof. I know these cleaning companies are really happy to see how much money they're saving and how much faster they're getting the jobs done now. Now, have you had somebody named like Bruno or something from a giant, giant construction company show up at your house, like a big dude, like threaten you to hey, be like, hey, man, so, stop doing this. <laughs> so, so not yet, but we might have to get some security at the, the front <laughs> entrance for Lucid soon if we uh, keep drawing. <laughs> Uh, uh yeah yeah you're you're hurting somebody's business i'm surprised somebody hadn't called you yet uh interesting well hey you know what you could do too you could also target them as a client you could be like hey man listen i'm happy to lease them to you guys too i i love win-win relationships so. <laughs> oh very good wrapping up here i want to ask you a couple of questions uh if you had to give a shout out to any aspiring entrepreneurs right now some buddies in college thinking about starting a business and they're down at Buffalo Wild Wings, drawing it out on a napkin. What, what would you tell them based on what you've learned? Oh, my goodness. Um, my, I think the biggest one is lean into failure uh, and be willing to take risks, especially like at that stage of your life. There's never going to be a better time than then to take a chance to bet on yourself. And mm. I'd say I put an asterisk next to the word failure because I don't believe in that word. I believe mm-hmm. any time you, you have a challenge, a setback, or what somebody might define as a failure, to me, that's a learning opportunity. That should be mm-hmm. a catalyst for you to, to learn something positive and grow. It could be a terrible experience for you, but if you just let it remain as that terrible experience, rather than being like, okay, this is why this happened, and this is how I could do this better the next time. If you're always iterating, that's how progress is made and I know I talked to a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs they are like, oh, but I'm just worried. What are people going to think? What if I fail? And I'm like, who's defining failure here? Like there is no failure mm-hmm. because what, what many people don't know about startups is how often they pivot. Like That's right. That's <laughs> the, the right. founders that are typically the most successful are the ones that just kept going. Yes. And kept pivoting. You're absolutely right. Really great advice, my friend. By the way, are you still in control of the company or have you taken on enough cash now to where the cap table is? Uh, who's in charge? 
Uh, we're still in charge, but uh, we do have a very nice supportive investor group as well. So we're very thankful for them. Okay. I think what I heard you say is if you vote, if it gets sticky and you and your buddies vote on something, you're still in control. Okay. All right. And then uh, last question is this. If you had to define Andrew's core purpose in life, kind of a big, big question, right? Big question. But what is your core purpose, man? Why are you here on this planet? Uh, I, it's a, a beautiful question. And, and one I actually think a lot about, and I wish I had a more grandiloquent response to it than I do. I, I think the simplest answer is I want to create a positive impact. Like to me, I want to be able to look back and, and see all the good I've done in this world and the lives I've changed and it, just the value I've brought. And I see that in so many different ways. I, I see it one in the technology we're building and the impact it can have on the market and mm. the, the families of these workers, you name it. Uh, I, I see it in terms of the company culture we're building in terms of having an inclusive workplace where people are genuinely excited to show up every day and contribute to this vision of what we're building. And I, I see it within my, my family life and our local community and mm. uh, just trying to find uh, things I care about that I want to volunteer for and, and create that positive impact. Because I, I know as an entrepreneur, it's easy to get very zoomed out about the big picture impact you want to have. But I also try to stay grounded and what's the impact I can have kind of day to day, week to week in my local community as well. Andrew, thank you so much for sharing your story on the Rider Flex podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Steve.